Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Simon, and I'm one of the ministers here. I'm delighted to be closing off the series that we've been following through in the book of Jonah this morning. But uh, as we come to it, let's pray. Jamie in the worship said these words, where would we be without your mercy? Where would we be without your mercy, Lord? And we thank you for it. We thank you that we've received it already. We welcome it, more of it in our lives. And we pray that you would make us those who extend your mercy. Amen. Well, my theme today is uh, a short fuse and a long nose. And that'll all become clear, I hope. Jonah chapter four has a special connection to this city of Oxford. In 1957, the Catholic Church commissioned a new official English language translation of the Bible. It was called the Jerusalem Bible. And uh, remarkably, they asked J.R.R. Tolkien to translate the chapter for the Bible or the book for the Bible of Jonah. The main editor was so impressed by uh, by Tolkien's translation of Jonah that he wrote to him saying, I wish we could have given you more to translate. However, what uh, in the NIV was called or translated as a vine and the old King James translates as a gourd, Tolkien translated as colosynth. Colosynth, anyone ever heard of that? (laughs) One sophisticated intellectual in the room. And uh, well, this is some sort of Middle Eastern gourd that resembles a honeydew melon. And uh, the editors didn't like this word, and so they changed it to castor oil plant, which is some tall leafy plant. And it seems that they suspected uh, Tolkien of inventing this word colosynth. And they wrote a letter to him and they said, none of your elf words, tollers. This is serious. This is the Bible. I love that. I believe Tolkien's choice was actually influenced not by Middle Earth, but by a 400-year-old stained glass window that we can see, you can go over and see it afterwards, in Christ Church Cathedral. And that window, here we are, depicts Jonah chapter four. And there's the prophet, and he's east of the city, and he's surveying Nineveh, and he sat under this tall and leafy tree with yellow colosynth fruit hanging. Although there's a bit of artistic, Dutch artistic license here because colosynths don't grow on a great big leafy tree, they grow along the floor. After the Civil War, during which time all the windows were taken down for fear of being hit by Cromwell's cannonballs, a Puritan cathedral cannon jumped on all bar three of the remaining Oxford stained glass windows. And this was one of the windows that remained unbroken. And I wonder why. I've been thinking about it all week. Why didn't that cannon kick this one in like he actually kicked the other ones in as it's described? And I think maybe he was convicted by it. Maybe he saw something of himself in old Jonah or maybe he saw something of Nineveh in this city. Not only did the Dutch artist get the colosynth fruit wrong, the gourd tree wrong, but I think, perhaps we can show that picture again, I think he got Jonah wrong. Because in the painting, Jonah is presented as being rather pensive and uh, with this sort of rather mild and open expression on his face. But as we saw in chapter four in our reading, Jonah, I'm pretty sure, did not look nice and handsome like that guy there. 
Okay, let me make two points. First, we see that Jonah has got a short fuse. The end of chapter three, the whole, as we saw last week, the whole of Nineveh repented. They had heard the message of God's judgment against their sin proclaimed to them through Jonah, and they responded. They opened their heart to that word. They opened their heart to God. They repented. They called out to God. They humbled themselves with sackcloth and ashes and turned to God. And it ends, that chapter ends with God having mercy upon them. It says because they repented, God relented. But when Jonah saw this, it really ticked him off. And so we come to 4 verse 1 and it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. One of the key words throughout this chapter that comes over and over again is the word anger and the other one is die. The Hebrew for being displeased, Jonah was displeased, is actually the word for trembling. Jonah was so ticked off, he was so annoyed, he was so pent up and angry with this that he was actually shaking with wrath. And the word for angry that we see over and again in this chapter is literally the word for burning, it comes from the root to burn. He shook and burned with anger towards these Ninevites and indeed towards God. Clark Gable famously said to Lana Turner in a 1954 movie, Betrayed, you're beautiful when you're angry. I don't think it was patronizing, but my wife says it's patronizing. <laughs> I said, but darling, you're beautiful when you're angry. Um, Jonah wasn't beautiful when he was angry. He was very, very ugly. And his anger was not simply at their sin. In fact, it wasn't at their sin. The irony is his anger is at their repentance. And the anger is at God for being merciful to them. Jonah takes first prize in the whole Bible for being the most effective preacher. One sermon, eight words, a whole city immediately repent. I mean, that's an anointing. But he also takes first prize for being the minister with the most serious attitude issues. He's disobedient to God. He's self-centered. He's whinging. He's racist. He's xenophobic. And he's full of self-pity. We've seen throughout that Jonah has been the recipient of grace and mercy. He received it from the uh, sailors who tried to save him against the storm. We saw that Jonah received grace from God who saved him by the whale and gave him a second chance. Jonah received grace from these Ninevites. They received the word rather than uh, torturing him as was their tradition. But Jonah has no grace. He shows no mercy and he begrudges the Ninevites the second chance that he himself receives. He's not amazed by grace, he's enraged by it. How dare his God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, how dare that God also want to be the God of the world, the God of other nations, and in particular, this very pagan, Assyrian people. How dare the Ninevites repent and get off scot-free? It shouldn't be that easy. They should get their comeuppance. That's his thinking. The name Jonah in Hebrew actually means dove, but we can see that he really is a hawk, and he's out for blood, and he wants to see victims. In verse 4, of chapter four, the Lord replies. He says, have you got any right to be angry? Sometimes we do have a right to be angry. Sometimes it is really right 
to be angry. There were times when Jesus was moved with anger because of issues of injustice and inequality, when people were being ripped off and being put down by the system. It's right at times to be angry at injustice. It's right to be angry at evil. It's right to be angry at suffering. It's right at times to be angry. But Jonah here has no right to be angry. Jonah actually doesn't answer God at this point because he knows he'll lose. Instead, verse five, it says, he went east of the city. He went east of the city. And in the Bible, going east is always a symbol of going away from God. It's a symbol of going into exile, of wandering. Adam and Eve went east of Eden. The murderer Cain left the presence of the Lord, it says, and went east. The people moved east and built the Tower of Babel uh, where they worshiped themselves. Lot went east to Sodom and Gomorrah. There's something about going east symbolized in scripture, symbolizing moving away from God. He goes east. God opens up a dialogue, but Jonah's so ticked off, he doesn't want to talk to God. I wonder if you've ever gone east. That God puts his finger on something, you say, I'm not, I'm not chatting about that. I'm stewing in the, the bile of my own bitterness, and I'm going east. Conversely, God's glory always comes from the east. Just an interesting sort of sub-study. Glory comes from these. John Donne in that wonderful Easter Day poem that he wrote talks about the Lord riding, meeting the Lord riding westward, coming from the east. In all dates, where you're sat here in the middle, under the floor, are hundreds of bones that we reinterred when we took the floor up about 20 years ago. And they're all Saxon saints right there in the center. And they're all lying that way with their heads up there and their feet here, ready to rise east to embrace the Lord coming from the east. But Jonah goes east. He's going away from the Lord. He's going to stew. And he sits on a hill overlooking a city in the heat of the day, hoping that the fire will fall on this people. And then again, we see God's mercy at work. It says in verse six, it was very hot. The Lord provided a plant to grow up. In a day, up it went and gave him shade. And Jonah was really pleased. What fickle emotions. And then the Lord provided a worm that came along and nibbled away at the bottom of the plant. And then the good collapses and Jonah's really ticked off. And then the Lord provides this hot scorching wind and Jonah's freaking out again. Twice it says there that he's angry and then twice it says that he wants to die. I want to die, verse three. I want to die, verse eight. And God replies, Jonah. Dude, he says, well, he doesn't say that, but I'm saying that. He says, do you have any right to be angry? God's asking some of you that question today. You got any right to be angry? And what does Jonah reply? Yes, he says. I do well to be angry, angry to death. In fact, it's a Hebrew idiom. It's like a swear word. It says, damned angry. He throws it back at God. Actually, Jonah has no right whatsoever to be angry with Nineveh, yet he is. God has every right to be angry with Nineveh and Jonah, and yet he isn't. And this anger in Jonah just spreads like a wildfire. It moves from being jealous for Israel's special relationship with God to hatred of the pagan Ninevites to resenting God for his mercy to outright rage to bloodlust and then to suicide. I mean, what a spiral of emotions. Anger externalized in Jonah He wants the Ninevites to die. And then anger internalized, he wants himself to die. There's only one letter between anger and danger. It's a dangerous thing. 
when you get angry and you keep that anger when it's not righteous, right anger. Many years ago, we invited a world-renowned minister for a weekend conference. He was remarkably gifted and uh, widely published, global following and all of that. But his preaching when he came had a rather strange animus about it. It had a sharp edge uh, to many of his comments. His hosts found that he was withdrawn and wouldn't engage with them. He, from here, the pulpit, insulted charismatics, which we are, you know, it was a general insult. He insulted women in ministry, despite the fact that after one of his messages, numerous of my female students responded to be missionaries. He insulted me, saying in my church, the men would have responded. And the worst thing was that he seemed to delight in talking about hell and actually said, God is glorified by sending people there. I really struggled with it. Others struggle with it. We had more letters with struggle than uh, uh, from any other speaker that we'd ever had. And it was no surprise to me when a few years later, this minister stepped aside from ministry And he described it later as stepping out of ministry to sort out his monsters. And then publicly, he humbly confessed them. He said, do you know what they were? Anger and sullenness and self-pity. And he later returned to ministry much wiser and more tender and meek. And I really benefit from his ministry in his old age. You know, good and godly people can really get it wrong and they can get trapped and they can end up with a core of bitterness in their soul. Maybe they were wronged against it and that started it, but they've allowed it to fester and metastasize inside. And I wonder this morning if there are people here who you've been angry. This was the phrase I thought the Lord gave me, angry for years. Angry at the wrong thing angry with someone, it may have been justified initially, but you become like a simmering pan of hot water that spills over and spits and burns others. And I think today the Lord says, do you have any right to be angry? And the Lord, through his tender mercy, wants to heal that anger that you carry. And he can do it like that. And at the end, when we come to communion, ask him, Lord, please heal me as I receive your mercy. Deal with my anger. And then maybe when there's an opportunity for prayer, you might like to come. So that's the first thing. Old Jonah, well, he might have been young, but young Jonah, he had a short fuse. Secondly, God has got a long nose. So verse two, Jonah wails, O Lord, Is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? Whose country? My country. (laughs) Verse three, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Quote, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He's saying, God, I don't like how you do God. Jonah didn't merely disobey God's call and flee for Tarshish because he was afraid of their cruel reputation. He did it because he had a sense that God would forgive them and he didn't want to see God forgiving them. He didn't want God to be merciful, kind, loving and compassionate. He didn't want God to relent. He wanted judgment to come. And Jonah throws back in God's face what I think is the most central core revelation of God that we find in the whole Old Testament. It's actually a statement that God said of himself in Exodus 33, when Moses says, God, show me your glory. Show me your very core essence. And God says, okay, I will hide you in the cleft of a rock. 
and I will cause my glory to pass by you and you'll see the back of it and I will proclaim my name. In proclaiming my name, I will reveal myself and you will know my glory. And what does God say when he does that? As he reveals himself, discloses his glory, there is this epiphany that Moses receives and it's the same words that Jonah quotes. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. These are words that Moses cites, Nehemiah, Nahum, Joel, David, Jonah. It's a core to who God is. Core revelation, Exodus 33. And Jonah throws God back at God. Say, I don't like how you do yourself. I don't like how you carry yourself. And I don't want to see you doing that for these Ninevites. God is merciful. The word is rachem from the word womb. In other words, there is this maternal compassion that God feels. And he's gracious. He's a gift-giving God. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. He gives grace. He gives gifts. And then he says, slow to anger. The Hebrew is erekapayim, and it means long-nosed. Long-nosed. God, you're long-nosed. It, it's an idiom, and it, uh, a Semitic idiom, and it just means that you're, you're, you're slow to anger because you take a deep breath. You're not flaring your nostrils. You just take a deep breath, slow to anger, slow to anger, and abounding in covenant-keeping love. You know, the whole book of Jonah is read at Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the most sacred day for the Jewish people. On one day, once a year, they come to God, having prepared all week, and they come for two reasons, to repent of their sins and to receive mercy. And on that day, the whole of Jonah is read in their service. Why? Because it's about repentance and it's about mercy. For months, I'd been struggling with someone and uh, what they did. And I wanted them to really get their comeuppance and their and punishment. And it got under my skin. It just stuck to me. And one day I drove to Winchester, I was collecting my son who'd come up from Bournemouth, we met halfway, and all the way down I was praying about this. I was just asking God what to do. And, and uh, my, the main thing I was feeling was punishment really. And I arrived early there before my lad's train got in. I thought I'd go to the cathedral and I saw a sign saying midday communion, midday Eucharist. I thought I'll go. And I sensed the Lord say, if you go... Uh, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to give you my grace, but I'm going to speak to you. So I went in, and uh, it was the service was printed on cards. It was Cranmer's 1662 communion. I, I've done that service. I've said it or been led in it a thousand times. I've memorized much of it. Uh, but on this occasion, something stood out that I'd never seen. I'd never seen it. And I kept seeing the word mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. The Lord is merciful. We do not come to this thy table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in thy you know, righteous manifold mercies. We are not worthy and so on. Mercy, mercy, mercy. You're merciful, you're merciful. The preacher in his full wallop got up and he spoke for two minutes. <laughs> what? Yes, just two minutes on God's mercy. 31 times I counted it twice on the service card. The service talks about mercy or merciful. And I was just overwhelmed. I was convicted before the beautiful liturgy of my sin, of my judgment, of my resentment, of my bitterness, of my wanting things to be done right and yet aware of God's mercy. God doesn't black Jonah, I would have, but he sighs over him. He says, Jonah, verse 11, you feel compassion for this dying plant that you didn't plant, you didn't do out. I put it there, that came up and down. Should I not have compassion 
on 120,000 people who know not their left hand from their right, not to mention all the cows. He cares about the animals. I, when I, as a former butcher before I was a priest, that makes me, you know. He cares about them cattle. And he cares about the people. He's a caring God. He cares for the cruel pagan Ninevites in their spiritual darkness. He cares for 120,000. It's an idiom. You don't know left from right. It means children. He cares for all the cattle on the hill. He cares for all your family. He cares for all your friends. He cares for the Russians cares for the Ukrainians, cares for the Israelites, cares for the Palestinians. He cares for you. And Jonah sat on a hill wanting Nineveh to die and wanting himself to die. But Jesus went to that hill to die, wanting us to live. We're coming to the Lord's table. What's it all about? God's anger being satisfied at the cross. His anger against our sin that we deserved being annulled by his son so that he could have mercy on us. Tolkien, towards the end of his life, in a letter to his grandson Michael, discussed his translation of Jonah chapter four. He said this, the real point is that God is much more merciful than the prophets. And God is easily moved by our repentance. And God will not be dictated to by high clerics whom he may even have appointed. Amen. Please stand.